In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me and rescue me speedily. Be a rock and refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress, and for your name's sake you lead me and guide me. You take me out of the net that they have hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hands I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. We welcome you to Hazelwood Christian Church Good Friday service. We're so glad that you have tuned in to join us and be a part of this special day. I hope you've taken time today, some time just to be still before the Father, uh, to ponder, to contemplate uh, the love of your God that would go so far is to come to earth and to go to the cross for us. We're glad you've joined us. I hope that you've planned a time with your family to come together and to gather together and watch us together, worship together to come before his throne. I also hope that you took some time to to prepare for some communion, a little bread, a little uh, grape juice in order to, uh, as we meet around the table, to celebrate this sweet season of God's sacrifice for us. So I hope you have that in front of you and are ready to worship. As we start tonight, we're reminded through the psalm of of our Jesus who is entering into this time of pain and suffering, that our Lord is surrendering himself and we want to journey alongside of him. We want to remember and take in the depth of his love, the depth of his sacrifice. Let's pray as we continue this hour of worship. Our Father God, we, we come before you and it's hard for us to find words of gratitude and thankfulness. It's hard for us, Father, to fathom all that Jesus went through. But tonight, as we gather together, I pray that we'll, be, we'll remember that our hearts will be stirred, that your grace will be valued, And that, Father, once again, we will commit ourselves to following Jesus, our Lord who died for us while we were still sinners. In Jesus' name, amen.
the concept of a potter on a canvas, a master potter who's able to create something out of almost nothing. It's kind of amazing, actually. Pottery does capture my attention. As a matter of fact, we have a pot right here. I think it's so much not what it ends up looking like, but in my mind, I look at it and I think, what's the process? How did it start? How did it become what it is today? You know, because pottery in itself is usually just clay taken from the earth, placed and, and molded and, and mixed as best as it can be in the purification of clay itself, and then all of a sudden grabbed out of a large vat of clay and thrown onto a potter's wheel. It's shapeless. It has no form. It has no purpose. It has no design. It's just simply a clump of earth. But when that clump of dirt, basically, is placed in the potter's hand, that potter is able to, to take it. And as it's sitting there on the wheel and it begins to spin and he adds just the right amount of water because he's got to keep that tension in that water inside the clay in order that that lump of clay become moldable. It has to stay soft in his hand. It can't become dry, otherwise it's not able to be formed. It creates too much work and it's hard already. It has to stay soft. It has to stay submissive to the touch of the master potter. And as that master potter begins to spin, he, he applies the pressure as he, on that mound of clay, and that mound of clay begins to rise. From nothing becomes something, and as he shapes it, and as he molds it, it all of a sudden is able to be seen as something with great purpose with great value, with great intention. There's something beautiful about a piece of pottery because it goes through the process of simply surrendering. Before it can be made hard and hold flowers or water or whatever it may hold, it has to say, stay very, very submissive to that master. You know, when we think about Jesus, Jesus fully God, took on the vessel of fully man. But in that position, in that place of being a vessel, Jesus took on this role of submission. He lived in submission. He lived fully in the submission of the Father. As a matter of fact, scriptures teach us that Jesus reveals that no matter what, everything that he said, the Father had told him to say. Everything he did, the Father instructed him to do. He lived a life submissive every day from the time he took his first breath on earth to the time he took his last on the cross. Jesus lived as a submissive vessel designed for purpose. It reminds us of how difficult it must have been for Jesus at times. I mean, it seems so easy for him, right? And yet, as we think about this Good Friday, it takes us to this garden it takes us to this place of intimacy. Jesus had spent many times in that garden. It wasn't the first time in the Garden of Gethsemane outside of Jerusalem. He'd been a lot of time with his disciples teaching, laughing, sleeping, eating. He'd spent time there praying, isolation. But this night, this night as Jesus entered the garden, there is a weight to it. You see, Jesus for 33 years had been planning for this night, for this day, for this moment. Many time in the three years of his public ministry, the, 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 those who despised him wanted to kill him, but yet they could not because it was not time. But this night, it was time. It was time for him to surrender. It was time to him to give away. It was time for him to lay down his life so that the sins of the world could be heaped upon him. It was this moment. And the question he had to wrestle with is this. Will I be submissive one more time? Will I surrender to the purpose that, of that which I have been designed? Will I, will I submit to the cross? 
He was overwhelmed that night. His disciples were pretty clueless, tired, exhausted after the Passover meal. But Jesus, Jesus was overwhelmed. Overwhelmed with the thought of the pain his body would have been in. And overwhelmed with the thought of experiencing the impact of sin that he had never experienced before. He was overwhelmed. And that's why we see in scriptures, this, this great text out of Luke chapter 22, verse 42, when Jesus cries out to the Father in his anguish, in his struggle, in his pain, he goes, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. How can we blame him? How can we blame him and say, is there another way? Possibly, is there another way? But the beautiful thing about the spirit of Christ is that it didn't end with that statement because it's followed by the most beautiful words that bring us hope. Because what Jesus said to the Father was simply this, yet, it's a powerful word. Father, if there's any other way, yet, not my will, but yours be done. You see, it's in that moment, that moment of submission. His love for the Father said, I'm gonna submit to you. His love for us says, I'm gonna submit in order that there may be hope. Jesus willingly surrendered that we may have life. The Hebrew writer in the fifth, in the tenth, tenth chapter, verses five through seven, write this to remind us of the willingness of our Jesus. He says, sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you, did not, you were not pleased. And then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. It's because of this. We celebrate on this night of grief with hope. You see, this is our beautiful, submissive Savior, Jesus, fulfilling the purpose of his design.
So we're in the garden. We're with Jesus. He is praying a high priestly prayer. The high priestly prayer over his people, his friends, his disciples, but also those who would come to follow him. We, we see the, the torment and the terror as he prepares for the next day. We know what is to come. We know what this day is. This Good Friday is a day of pain. It's a day of pressure and it's a day of bloodshed. But not only that, this day is a day of brokenness. It is a day of hard-fought fear by our Savior and by his followers and by those who would come across him. We see Jesus taken away. We see him betrayed and taken by these guards and these officials to be put on trial by the, the leaders of the Jewish faith. We see him go to trial with Pilate, and we see him flogged and beaten and despised in the public view. We see terror taking place. But we also see rejection from Jesus' people, from his family, from those who should have accepted him because they knew they were in the presence of the Messiah. We see we see him denied by his closest friends. And we see pain and emotional hurt in this midst. We see very obviously as it sits behind me the cross and the physical pain that comes along with it. The hands, the side, the crown of thorns that was placed on his head. The physical brokenness there. We see all of these things as we, as we walk with Jesus on Good Friday. We see the rejection and the, and the disdain and the hurt. And then we follow Jesus as he carries his own cross to Golgotha. And we experience pain on this day. We experience brokenness. And this brokenness is not limited to a physical hurt, to the nails driven through his hands, his feet, to the spear in his side and the thorns on his head. This brokenness is not limited to a physical body. This brokenness is, is yes, it's physical. It hurts. It's a pain we cannot imagine. It was a bloody mess on this Friday, 2,000 years ago. But Jesus also had emotional and relational breaks on this day. He was scared, rightfully so. His friends betrayed him and hurt him. His people rejected him. But it's not limited to just these two. This physical, this emotional, this relational Brokenness, it is also spiritual brokenness. We see, we hear from Jesus on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because in this moment, as Tim stated it earlier, Jesus is experiencing sin for the very first time. And not only that, He's experiencing a separation from his father for the first and only time in eternity. Jesus was physically spent and broken, emotionally terrorized, relationally betrayed and hurt. But ultimately, we find ourselves seeing that Jesus was broken broken for us, broken on our behalf. And we come around this table, this communion celebration, this Lord's Supper to celebrate his sacrifice. We, we, we celebrate this every week. 
with the juice and the bread, and we see in remembrance of him. And tonight we, we, we celebrate this communion in remembrance of this brokenness. Brokenness on our behalf, brokenness for us, brokenness for salvation. And in, in doing so, we will symbolically break the vessel that we have in front of us that represents Jesus. And as, and as it's broken, take the cup, take the juice that represents the blood, take the bread that represents the body that's broken for us in remembrance of him.
When's the last time you took the time, the effort to push everything aside, to push the schedule aside, to push the to-do list back on the counter, and simply survey the wondrous cross? Survey, it's a great word. It means to look at intensively, to look at details, to look at thoroughly. And that's what we need to do on a regular basis, not just on Good Friday celebrations, but we need to survey because there's a lot to see. There's a lot to capture of Jesus on that cross because at that moment, on that cross, everything holds in the balance for us. It's vital as we see Jesus willing to go to the cross, willing to be beaten, willing to be broken. You see, it's really hard to look on Jesus at that stage, in that condition. 
Uh, a matter of fact, to look upon Jesus on the cross, it's hard to do. We, we want to turn away. Because in our own mind, as we, we use our imagination, we can only imagine what he looked like. The horror, the pain, the shame. And to think that he was there because, because of me, because of you, because of all of us. And it's his love in that moment on that cross that he endured that pain and that brokenness and that suffering. He was willing to lay himself down and, and take on this, this complete brokenness that seems like there's no way it could be put together, and yet he entrusted himself to the Father. Would death hold him down? Would he keep the promises he had made through his ministry that he would rise again in three days? Would it become a reality? But you see, it was in that moment, on, on that cross, where we see the blood of Christ flowing out of him, the life flowing out of him. Isaiah 53 is a beautiful text and part of that chapter simply speaks of our Jesus when he says, surely he took our pain, he bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Two incredible words there. Peace and healed. Isn't that what we long for today in our world, peace? Peace with our neighbors, peace with the people around us. That the power of the cross is capable of bringing peace to our homes, it's capable of bringing peace into our relationships, it's capable of bringing peace between ourselves and God, which is the greatest breaking of all relationships that there are. God is able to bring peace and healing. That's the hope that we need, that's the truth of what the cross means for us. It takes something of our own lives, broken because of our own sin, and able to be made whole. The power of the cross restores our wrongs. The power of the cross brings hope to humanity. As Jesus hung on the cross, gasping for air and for breath, states in scriptures that as it got close to noon, it began getting darker and darker and darker. Luke's account actually tells us that the sun no longer shined. The earth itself was trembling. It says at that time at three o'clock in the afternoon that the veil in the temple tore in half. The holy of holies exposed to humanity, torn from top to bottom, in order that now, because of the work of Christ on the cross and his willingness to sacrifice himself for us, that which separated us was more than a curtain. Sin could be forgiven completely because Jesus and Jesus alone is capable of paying the complete cost of the sins of humanity. It's kind of amazing that something whole, Jesus, perfect, had to become broken so that we who are broken could be made whole. Jesus, Jesus as he is on that cross, and that moment, that last moment, his last words are just simply this. 
Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And with that, he took his last breath. Let us survey the power and the might of that wondrous cross. The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. Sorrow may come in the darkest night. The cross has the final word. The cross has the fire.